rewind, and you're back on the flight deck with the E2, um, they're landing and so on, and you go up there, what do you do? Um, we're usually up there about 15 minutes before the plane lands because you never know if they're bringing us down at the beginning of the cycle or at the end of the landing cycle. So we're up there just when it touches down so we can uh, guard the props, shut down the aircraft, fold the wings, all that stuff. When the air crew's done, they come out, they tell us what's broken, what's not broken, so we can get a head start on fixing it. Once they're out of the way, um, we go nose to tail, do a post-flight inspection, uh, checking for loose knobs, missing stuff, anything they forgot. The, uh, the air boss or the mini boss would be calling out what airplane's next in the pattern. And when we'd hear them call banger, they'd usually say banger 601 or 602, whatever actual physical side number aircraft it was, is basically the next one to land. Um, we'd usually sit by the island until we heard our plane, then we'd walk up to the foul line, you know, towards the front of the ship, foul line kind of keeps the, the landing area separate from the I'm not going to get run over by an airplane area. And wait for them to taxi out of the landing area. They taxi basically into the safe area. We guard the props and we walk with it, whether they're parking it up front or parking it in the back of the ship. We basically follow it till they park it. They shut down the engines once, they, when, once the uh, ship kind of gives us back custody of our own airplane. Um, like I said, they'll shut it down and uh, that's when we go about doing our stuff. Um, all the different jobs, all the different rates each have something to do. Some guys are checking the tires. Some guys are checking the motors. You know, I'm checking all the electronics and all the, um, the classified stuff inside the airplane to, to make sure it's all didn't break, <laughs> uh, didn't get, go missing, didn't fall off. Um, so yeah. basically at that point we can say the plane's ready to go. So if they need it to fly again, uh, we pull out the, uh, the hard drives. We call them RMCs, we call them bricks because they physically heavy like a brick. Um, but they contain the software to run the airplane. And they also record or can record a lot of the data that the uh, air crew sees during the flight. So we pull it down so if they ever need to, they can analyze it, uh, send it away for testing, send it away for analysis, you know, whatever they decide they want to do for that day. And so after you, you know, strip that, and that's on the flight uh, deck? Yep. And, and so, so tell me about that, like the, what you do, you pull it out and then you take it where? Um, we, we actually have carrying cases that are designed to carry these. Um, they're, they're classified secret, um, which is not a secret. It's pretty standard knowledge that they're classified secret. Um, so in an ordinary place, it'd take two of us to carry them somewhere. But because you're kind of isolated on the carrier, you can do it by one person. So we take the actual bag, there's six of them on the airplane, and we have to take the shortest route from the flight deck where our airplane is back to our shop. Um, sometimes it's right across the flight deck. Sometimes it's, it's through the skin of the ship, depending on whether uh, aircraft are still going. Um, but once we do that, we, we go inside our shop. We have to make sure everything is locked. Nobody's not supposed to be there is there. Uh, then we open up the safe, put them in the safe. We've got tracking sheets so we know what, what RMCs are on what airplane. Uh, we know who signed them out, who put them in the airplane, who took them out of the airplane. Um, so basically, once we get them back in there, we have to check them back in, log them back in. You know, then we have to close the safe, log the safe, shut, and wait for the, for, for the round to start again. And, and that safe, the classified safe, that takes two people? Uh, yeah, they call it two-person integrity. Um, there's two different sides to the combination, so one person can't open it by themselves. Um, two people, so half the group has combination A, half the group has combination B, and you need one A and one B to get in there. And um, talk about um, chain of custody. Th these things have to have chain of custody? Uh, yeah, I mean, anything, anything classified, period, no matter what level it is, it's got tracking, per, some type of tracking associated with it. So the, the higher you get, the, the more severe the tracking is. You know, the lower classification you get, the, I wouldn't say relaxed it is, but the easier it is to track. Like I said, we, we have, we had everything tracked by serial number. So I could tell you this, this RMC flew in this airplane on this day. You know, it flew twice on this mission, it flew twice on that mission. So I could tell you where they were because that's how much we tracked it. Um, if we ever transfer them away to anybody, there's a whole another set of paperwork that goes with it, um, normally. Um, so basically, we account that we're giving these away to this person, they're accepting it. You know, basically, it, it covers us saying, this is our documentation that so-and-so has it and so-and-so took it. So you're, you're sitting in your workstation after this one flight landed, 
and you had just put that stuff away and kind of stuck me through what happened next. It was out of your um, if I remember correctly, it was kind of near lunchtime, so nobody was on deck running up any airplanes right away. We had a couple hours before we had to go back up there to launch another airplane. So we were just sitting there. A lot of times in our off times, there's nothing to work on. We're playing video games, watching one of the TV shows that the, the ship puts on or one of the movies. Um, maybe 20 minutes at this point after the, the plane came down and everything, because um, the whole post-flight inspection takes maybe 10, 15 minutes, depending on how quick you are. Um, locking them in the safe as long as everyone's there is, you know, two, three minutes of time. Uh, you know, we're way off in the corner of the ship. The only thing near us is a resting gear, or not a uh, cat string for all their equipment. So we're kind of in a little corner all by ourselves. So our officers never bothered us. Our commanding officer never bothered us. You know, they'd make us go to them before they'd come to us. And all of a sudden there's a knock on our door. We have a combo lock on the door so that nobody can get in there without the combination. And despite the fact that he knew the combination, never used it. I'm pretty sure he forgot it after we taught him. Um, but he knocks on the door and there's him. He's in his flight suit. There's two guys behind him in flight suits. Um, they weren't our officers. They weren't shipborne officers. So I had no clue who they were. Uh, to the best of my rec recollection, they had Air Force insignia on, um, but it was a relatively quick process. He walks up, knocks on the door. We open it. He kind of looks at me. He's like, I need the bricks that were on the plane. Okay. Uh, I only had one side to the safe, so it was a couple minutes before the other side came back up. We open them. I start to sign him out. He says, don't worry about it. And we hand him uh, the six plane, uh, bricks that were on our flight, uh, three of our bags, and he leaves. And that was the, uh, the last we saw those. No, no documentation to uh, account for where they went, no signing them out, no nothing. Um, all that's really left to track those, as far as I know, is handwritten scribble in a binder that's long been destroyed by now. So, um, rewind up to the point right before he knocked on the door and, um, and just take me through that one more time. Um, um, like I said, and, uh, uh, there was a knock on the door, open the door, because uh, they can't get in without the combo. Our commanding officer's there, uh, two other uh, guys in flight suits who I'm assuming were Air Force officers, because pretty sure that's the insignia they had on but they were not on the ship earlier. I did not see them come on the ship, so I'm not sure how they got there. Um, but the, the skipper basically said, I need the flights off of, or the bricks off the flight. We, we opened the safe once the other half got there, because it was a couple minutes, because I only had one, um, one side to the safe. Start to log him out, didn't work. He pretty much stopped me in the middle of that process. Basically said he wanted them. We put them in the bags. He took them, he took his two anonymous officers and left. So, at this point, you didn't know that that plane had been involved in an unknown, you know, un sighting of an unknown object. Would there have been data on those bricks that could have helped look at that sighting? Yes. Um, we were heavy in testing with CEC stuff, which is a cooperative engagement capability. Um, so, they, they can record a lot of the stuff the plane does. Um, can't say exactly everything they record and what they can't record. But it records a lot, and you can tell a lot about the flight by what they record. And it would have been on those bricks. It would have been on those hard drives. Um, so chances are there's something on there that they wanted to see or something they wanted to see if they could see. And you mentioned that you um, also knew about the, the Greyhounds and that these guys didn't arrive on that. So. Um, yeah, the, there's so many similarities between a C2 Greyhound and an E2 Hawkeye that you can work on either one and, and know what you're doing. So a lot of times they didn't, the, the COD crews stayed on the beach and they just sent their planes out. We'd catch them, we'd turn them around, we'd send them back to them. So we were usually up there and I was the one in my shop with COD experience. So if they were on deck, I was generally up there helping them unload so I could see the people coming on and off. Um, it's, it's hard to miss because they're, they're wearing distinctive helmets, they're wearing distinctive little rubber ducky life preservers. So you see who comes on and off, and, you, and when you're doing it every day, you kind of notice. So I don't remember seeing two guys in flight suits get off, so. And you can recognize an Air Force flight suit from another one. Yeah, um, we used to do um, joint exercises with the Air Force all the time, um, basically comparing the, the Hawkeye versus the Air Force AWACS. So we, we dealt with them frequently. I, I wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you all the enlisted ranks, yeah. but the officer ranks, those I knew. Usually when somebody came to take those bricks from us, 
it was one of our lieutenants and a tech rep, you know, somebody from uh, Raytheon or somebody from Northrop Grumman, one of the, the companies, they're the ones who come to take those. It's happened before where we knew, we've given them data or done tests and we sign them out and we transfer basically custody them to those. And that was the difference between uh, this specific incident and normal is we didn't transfer custody to anybody. We just kind of signed them out to the skipper and washed our hands of it. If, say, somebody in an official capacity needed to find those drives, do, they, do you think they still exist somewhere in the chain of command? Um, no, because um, they're literally commercial computer hard drives inside a funky case. When they go bad, we take them apart and we them to a thousand pieces. Um, if you ever want to dive for one, go look in the bottom of the Persian Gulf. There's all kinds of smashed up ones there. But the they, they wanted the data. For that. The data exists somewhere. somewhere. The data, I can almost... There's no reason for them not to save that data because they can do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, from training to, you know, analyzing. They can do all kinds of stuff with it. And all the systems in use are still in use today. It's not like it's an old airplane that doesn't fly anymore. It's a couple newer versions of some of the technology. It's all still there. It's all still used. So, so you're... Yeah, we had people coming. Hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Oh, we're making a tourism video for the canyon. Um, oh, yeah, so you're sitting in your work area, and this, you're kind of looking at each other, and then after um, we've gone for a long time, so he comes walking in, and you kind of describe that it was you guys started talking. I mean, it, when, when Roger goes flying, it's not uncommon for them to kind of be gone for a little while because they do debriefs in the ready room. They talk about all kinds of random stuff stuff that could have gone wrong during their flight, stuff they screwed up, stuff. So it's not unnormal for him to, to be gone for a while. Sometimes he can go from the ready room and go down to eat, you know. <laughs> so for him to be gone for a while was not abnormal. But when he came back in, most of us had kind of gotten back into the shop at that point. So there's probably five or six of us sitting in there. When he walks in the door and he's kind of looking not his normal self, and he starts telling us not what happened, but he starts to tell us what happened and never really got to the point of telling us the, the whole story because our, our division chief walked in and basically put a squash to it and said, if you're told not to talk about it, we're not talking about it. So before we could ever get the whole story, it, it got squashed, it got shut down, and we were basically told not to talk about it, not. Oh, we're gonna pause for a second, okay. So if, let's just talk about Roger and what you know. So who is, who's Roger and what happened? Uh, Roger was an in-flight technician. Uh, it was a program in the Hawkeye community allowing technicians to basically fly in the air crew, aircraft to, to troubleshoot problems we couldn't duplicate on deck. Uh, Roger was our only one. He flew quite frequently. Uh, he probably had some more hours than some of the officers in the squadron. Um, but he was airborne during Commander Fravor's flight. Um, so full, full mission, full Full air crew, so there are five people in the airplane. Um, Roger would have been seating in the, the radar officer seat, which is uh, kind of towards the back middle of the plane. So to the, to the side of each one of them or behind them, depending how the chair is rotating, is a window. Uh, the, the air crew, the pilots have uh, shielded windows, so they've got plenty of vision. Um, say, same object referred to by Commander Fravor kind of comes up along the side of the Hawkeye, forms up you know, where everybody can see him and then takes back off again. Uh, um, mission continued, they, they came back to the ship. Uh, the, the entire crew was met by somebody who took him down. They got debriefed, they got talked to, they were told not to repeat it. They signed non-disclosure agreements. And uh, it was after that that Roger finally came back to the work center to kind of hint to us what was going on. Um, so Looking back at all this in, in the films that you've seen so far, do you have any personal um, opinion as to what these things were? Um, I, I'm one of those who has to see to believe. Um, and obviously, I've seen the evidence of this, so it exists. Um, I don't know if it's truly like extraterrestrial technology. It could be, you know, advanced technology work you're working on. It could be advanced technology somebody else is working on. It could also just as daily be or just as easily be advanced technology from off the planet. It is something, I wanna know what it is. Um, 
that's the whole reason I chose to come forward to contribute to the story because there is a story here. There is more information here. Uh, and the more of us that talk about it, the, the better chance of the full story coming together. What would you say to your former shipmates that are, are out there that could lend support to this and to the pilots and so on? Um, not everybody's in a position to, to open their mouth because um, it is borderline uh, a sensitive subject with um, security clearances and stuff. But there's a way to come forward without putting yourself in a position to share classified material or share anything you weren't supposed to say. You know, Roger came forward and contributed not the whole story, but he verified stuff that was in his realm to verify without really putting himself at risk. So there's a way to come forward without, you know, opening the lid on something you're not supposed to talk about. You, you just got to take your time to think about it, what you're going to say and how you're going to present it because that's how it matters to, to protect yourself, to protect the people you're talking to, you know, and to protect the information that you swore to protect when you were in the service. Um, okay, Commander Fravor has said that no one ever told him or his staff to be quiet about it and not talk about it. Didn't happen. Obviously, Roger had a different experience. Why do you think it was that their um, squadron in their particular plane was told not to talk about it and did you know sign NDAs and all that? Um, it probably has a lot to do with um, the information that Fravor had access to, the information that the Hawkeye had uh, access to. Um, fighter pilots are restricted in a lot of the information they get. They, they can record a lot of information, but they don't actually see it. Where we can see and record it, there's a big difference between the, the, the environments that they operate in. So that's my guess is it had a lot more to do with what the Hawkeye saw and the Hawkeye recorded. Um, because you're opening a whole can of worms on that side of the fence versus, you know, I'm in a, a strike fighter and I saw some stuff and my FLIR recorded it. Um, FLIR technology is common knowledge. FLIR technology is very widely accepted. It's commercialized. It's, there's not many secrets. I'm sure there is some, but there's not many secrets behind the FLIR technology that the Navy flew. So it's, I'm sure it has a lot to do with the divergence of technology between the two aircraft. The E-2 Hawkeye, could, would you say it's similar to like the quarterback of the air wing? Well, um, without a doubt. So just tell me like briefly, like the E-2 Hawkeye operates this way. Um, the Hawkeye's got, it's got its co-pilot, it's got its pilot. They're basically taxi drivers. Their job is to shuttle around the three guys in the back. Um, you've got a radar officer, a combat information center officer, and an air control officer. And between the three of them, they do battle, battle management control, they do search and rescue control. Um, they can run 1v1 exercises where the, the pilots are training, you know, squadron versus squadron exercises where they're dogfighting and doing all that. We have the whole picture with all the, the sensors in the airplane with, with, you know, the radar. We can tell where they are. We can know, we know where they are better than they, when the, where, uh, where they are. So um, we control everybody. We tell okay, the bad guy's coming, go there. So, you know, the air wing relies on us to tell them where everybody is, to tell them where to go. We can see the whole picture because we're tied in with the, the ships, we're tied in with their own aircraft, we're tied in with allied aircraft. It, it's a whole giant battle management picture that we see, which is why we kind of control everybody. Was there anything that, that I hadn't asked you that you wanted to say? Um, I'm sure I'll think of something later. <laughs> yeah, that's how it always works. <laughs> oh crap, let's record now, right? <laughs>